So please know that this is being recorded. I think most of you are familiar with Zoom. You've joined us before. So a reminder that you can mute and unmute. Um, you can raise your hand, but we tend to be informal. You know, use that chat pod if you have questions. Um, you can also change your screen view so you can toggle with that as well. The biggest thing I would ask is if you are not speaking, if you could remain muted, it just helps to cut down on some of that background noise. Um, so we're going to share just a couple of QR codes, but if you want any of these links, please just let us know. You know, we'll pop them into the chat pod throughout this morning, but we're really sharing quite a bit through Facebook. Um, quite a bit on resources, on information, on updates, events, but we're also trying to share some information and content that we hope you can use in your own community communities outreach efforts. So definitely follow us on Facebook if you're there on social media. A couple of things coming up. So of course we're kicking off today with um, the signs part of the, the conversation with, with Mike. And then next week on Tuesday, um, he will be back and he's going to be talking, or I'm sorry, we're kicking off today with lines and pavement marking. And then next week we're gonna talk about signs and digital printing. So join us again next week if you're not registered for that one. Please um, you get registered if you're having registration questions. You know how to find us and we're happy to help. Also want to mention, we have a really great conversation um, coming up with uh, Kenya Rutland. Kenya is an outstanding speaker. Cannot recommend um, enough that you join us for this. Um, Bettina and myself and others on our team were really fortunate to see Kenya um, through the NLTAPA, our LTAP network. Um, he was a keynote speaker, has a really good conversation planned on how to um, really bring your leadership um, to, to your team during times of uncertainty and what we can do to lead with inspiration. So if you've got any of those leaders, whether they're leaders in title or leaders in nature in your organization um, that aren't aware of this event yet, please share it with them. That's coming up next week. We would love to have you know, as many of our public works friends come in as we can. Um, and join us for that. Uh, next, we want to just remind you about trenching and excavation protection. We've got several seats available for that. So that one is available for re registration. We've got a really great PW peer panel coming up um, talking about how to inspire public works advocacy in your community. So we hope that you'll be joining us for that as well. And then we're kicking off a pavement series with Bobby Betzold from All States Material Group and some other guests. So that should be a really good Five, um, five, I think we're doing it every other week. So five sessions over 10 weeks. Um, and we're filling in all of this with lots of other content and workshops and such. So if you have not checked out the calendar, definitely check out the calendar, keep in touch. If you have any questions um, about what's going on or how to register, you know, please reach out. We'll share some information on that as well um, as we move along today, the, the registration system. So one thing that's super important is we want to make sure for attendance for purposes, everybody is um, captured. We know who's there. We know some of you are sharing screens, socially distanced, of course. So please make sure right now to take attendance, put everybody's name in the chat pod. Put your name if you're there in attendance, if you've got a colleague there with you. Um, this is really important for Road Scholar Hour. So this is our attendance moment. Um, we're not going to go through name by name and ask you. Good morning, Jason. Thanks for letting us know you are there. I'm seeing folks are chiming in. Lori's got Jack, and, or oh, I'm sorry, she's got Jake and Bob with her. Good morning. Um, so thank you all for letting us know you're there. If others can do that, we just want to make sure that we are getting attendance for all of you. I won't get into too much of this, um, but we do want to remind you um, that we're recording this. And I did not update the screen. This will actually be one and a half technical Road Scholar hours. And we'll share that um, post-workshop evaluation at the end for those who want the technical Road Scholar hours for that. Please stay socially distanced. You know, heroes wear lots of re retroreflective gear, protective equipment, but you also should be wearing your masks, um, staying socially distanced, staying well. We want to remind you of that. And as we get into the good stuff here, some of you are familiar with menti.com if you've been with us before during a workshop. But we are going to ask everyone to participate in letting us know what you'd like to hear out of this workshop today. If you can grab your mobile device, your cell phone, open another browser window. window. I personally prefer my cell phone that I don't have to toggle with the Zoom. But if you would open a browser and go to www.menti.com. Sorry, my lamp is hiding the code. Bettina's going to put the code in the chat pod for you as well. It's 5632631. Um, so when you get to menti.com, just go ahead and put in that code. Um, we are going to ask you to kind of play along with us here and, and share some, some comments and some information as we get underway. 
So just to test this out to make sure we have everybody with us and everybody's in Menti, the very first question is probably the bigger one for um, on your minds this morning as you got um, headed into work, which is the closest to your breakfast? Oh, we already have somebody who's following along with my breakfast, coffee, give me all the caffeine. Egg and cheese sandwich, very good. Cereal, pancakes the other day, but today's a coffee day. We have coffee. Maybe a lot of people haven't had time for breakfast yet. Hopefully you'll get it after this. Oh, we're egg and cheese sandwich and cereals kind of staying neck and neck. We're gonna give everyone a moment there to, we got some responses still coming in. No donuts? Nobody got a blueberry muffin or anything? I don't know, I think donut and coffee kind of go together. All right, so we got a lot of coffee people. Yeah, everybody's still, still rocking the coffee this early in the morning. Awesome, so that gives you a quick little taste of what we've got going on with Menti and the important stuff is coming up here on the next slide. We wanna know what is one thing that you would like to know more about after this training? Again, we're so thankful to Paul and Mike for joining us. Um, and they, they've kind of asked to, to get a sense of what you're hoping to know more about. So if you don't um, mind going to the, the next screen on Menti, you're gonna use that same code and it's gonna ask you to, um, you can just kind of open share one thing you'd like to know more about. Good morning to Mary and team at the Detroit Metro Airport. We've got some answers coming in. Something I don't know. Hey, that's always a it's always a success. If we can get you to join us and take away something you didn't know before, then that's a win. And I hope that you, Mike and Paul, I hope that you're able to see these as well. Um, so we've got retro reflection, pros and cons of each type of pavement marking, the different types of products, the durability of the different options. I'm gonna give everyone another 30 seconds or so to share their, their thoughts on this one. Equipment. Hey, no idea, that's good. This will be wide open then. We hope you'll take something. <laughs> good question so far. Yeah. Equipment, we got equipment a couple times. New paint techniques, quality testing. I know sometimes it takes a while to type in your response, so we'll give everyone another 15 seconds. If there's anything that hasn't been shared that, that you would like to have our presenters keeping in mind as they're working through their content this morning. How to enact pavement marking consistently across the streets. Excellent. Thank you all for pros and cons of pavement markings. Great. So I see some are still chiming in. And if, if we missed anything, you feel free to pop it in the chat pod. That's the other thing we want to remind you is the chat pod is available. Questions, comments. Um, if, you, if you want some more information on something, please make sure you're using that chat pod as it's helpful to to engage and network and, and chat with us. All right, I'm gonna move right on to the next part. You can ignore this. This is me jumping ahead. I'm gonna stop my screen share. And what we've got now for you are just a couple of polls to, to get this underway. I can find my mouse hiding here. So I'm gonna launch a couple of Zoom polls. So you should see the first one coming up asking if your agency has paint or thermal equipment to maintain handwork. And Mike or Paul, feel free to jump in if you wanted to add anything to these questions as I'm sharing them on polling. Yeah, no, this is a good question. Kind of gives us an idea of who's who's here, uh, what kind of work you guys are doing. Uh, if you're actively, you know, doing paint handwork or, or thermal handwork. I do see Jeff from uh, Portsmouth. I know he's doing some, he's got a couple thermal units. So be interested to see if anyone else is doing thermal or primarily paint. So it looks like we have a good amount of people that are doing handwork, uh, and I'm guessing most of that is paint. All right, so I will share those results quickly. Yeah, so most are, we have the paint or thermal equipment to do that. All right, and let's go to our next poll here. And in this next one, we are gonna be asking you about some specifications. How are you using them? So yeah, really 
gauging how uh, each agency does their own um, specifications or do they use New Hampshire DOT specs? Uh, New Hampshire DOT updates theirs pretty regularly. Um, they add, they're considering adding data logging and some new technologies to their specs, but we'll talk a lot about uh, some of the concepts that, that they're implementing and that some of the towns and cities are implementing as well. All right, about 60% of the vote. So I'm gonna give it another couple of seconds here and then I'll share this poll. Pretty even. Yep. All right, and then last one I believe is when did you last update those specs? And Mike, I, I put some dates here to the question, but feel free if you wanted more granular information to help the conversation today, we can have folks put that in the chat pod. No, that's great. It's good, good timing there. So thank you as you're all answering that. I'm gonna be very, very quickly at this point, turn it over to, to Mike and Paul, but I do wanna apologize because um, as much as I have stumbled through figuring out some technology, I was not able to help figure out a camera issue we're having this morning from Mike. So I appreciate his patience and his flexibility. We always love to see our presenters, um, but this morning that is not uh, aligning in the stars or, or working out for us. So my apologies for that. Thank you, Mike, for your patience. Um, but we are going to share these results. And then I'm gonna very quickly Go on mute here and we're gonna turn over the floor for the good stuff. Thank you all again for, for being here with us. Please let Bettina or I know if we can help with anything. Okay, so I will share my screen. Marilee, if you could just authorize me to share. Oh, I'm good. Here we go. Okay. So can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Good, good, good. Well, thanks again, Marilee. Uh, uh, thank you, Satina. Uh, thanks, everybody in New Hampshire here um, for coming this morning. Uh, both uh, Paul and myself are, are from 3M, and we're excited to talk to you about pavement markings. So, um, I will move along. Let's see. So, um, yeah, just give you a little background. Uh, Paul is uh, in Minnesota. He uh, he works for uh, 3M, just like me. He works for the Tra Transportation Safety Division. Um, without Paul, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And um, you know, he he primarily reaches out to local agencies, kind of updates uh, all you guys on new programs and. Um, things that we're doing, new products, and, and really focuses on uh, reaching out to our agencies to, to make sure that they're in the know for, for 3M. He, uh, he's, he's good at what he does, and uh, someday I think he'll, he'll probably be out in the field in Minnesota at some point. Right, Paul? <laughs> That's the goal. That's the goal. And, you know, we'll hopefully when COVID lifts, we'll be able to get Paul out here as well. Uh, to meet some of you guys when uh, when some of the travel bans lift. Um, so my name is Mike Allen. I, um, I've been around for a little while, about 15 years with 3M covering New England. And uh, I live in Southern New Hampshire, Atkinson, New Hampshire. So I actually talked to uh, to our, our road uh, road agent, Ted Stewart down here. We, uh, we, we demonstrate some 3M products in, in Atkinson and we, uh, we tried out some new specifications for paint. Uh, so we're, actively uh, testing things here in Atkinson, but uh, generally speaking, uh, I'm working primarily with the DOTs and the local agencies in New England, and we're focused on, um, on pavement markings and signing. And pavement markings is, is near and dear to our ATSA chapter, ATSA's American Traffic Safety and Services Association. We just had, ATSA just had their expo. I was the past president for our New England chapter, and uh, I do chair up their pavement marking committee. And uh, if any of you go, you guys want uh, to be involved with that, just reach out. We talk about innovative pavement marking solutions uh, approximately about twice a year when we meet. We've been doing virtual meetings um, so far this year. 
and uh, I'll, I'll add some of that content to, uh, to our discussion today. So our agenda, really um, to really look through some of the different pavement marking MUTCD specifications, uh, the materials, um, go through uh, wet reflective and durable markings from New Hampshire, um, key inspection and takeaways, and, uh, and really we want to help you get what you pay for, maximize the, uh, the tax dollars, right? There's no one product that you're going to walk away from here today and say, you know, I can use this in every situation. It's going to provide, you know, best scenario for me. Uh, there's so many variables that you want to take in consideration. And a good pavement marking program uh, really uh, has the ability to, to use different types of products and different applications. Um, and then obviously the safety impact of all weather markings. So what do we promote? Um, at 3M, we have our own periodic table of, of technologies. And, and if you're looking for a stock tip, 3M is a, is a, is a, is a solid company. Uh, we've been around uh, since 1902. Uh, we were out of Twin Harbors, Minnesota, and the company was founded on mining abrasives. And we took that, put it in sandpaper, and the rest is history, right? So we like to educate on a lot of our technologies that you see over here and, uh, and talk about what we have really providing industry knowledge um, uh, as well to, to, to get you up to, up to speed. We, we've done a lot with uh, COVID-19 personal protective equipment, as you might imagine, and we're, we're, we're still running our lines net, uh, worldwide to, to catch up and provide first responders and, uh, and construction workers and, and DPW guys like yourself the ability to, to use some of this PPE. So if you have any additional questions, we do have a safety division. My safety uh, division representative is out of Exeter, New Hampshire. So if you guys uh, need anything or in that realm of the world, don't hesitate to reach out. Partnering with um, state and local agencies in New Hampshire has been a priority as I sit on uh, our ATSA chapter um, board. I, I am also on the Strategic Highway Safety Plan Committee for New Hampshire. And New Hampshire's focus um, Strategic Highway Safety Plan program is called Driving Towards Zero. Uh, and really the, the focus of these uh, strategies that the state and all the safety um, safety champions come up with is, is how do we reduce crashes? How do we go, get to zero deaths, right? And so simple things like pavement markings here, uh, rumble strips are some of the things that, that we help with for uh, delineation on your curves, right? We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Simple things that you can do from a local standpoint to address some of these things. Next, uh, I want to let you know that you can have you have access to all of our pavement marking, signing, and e-learning marketplace uh, at the touch of your your phone. If you type in 3M Tech Central, you can get to our our app that allows you uh, direct access to all of our applications. And so, with um, <clears throat> the with this pro uh, this process of uh, of actually doing education now, we like to focus on, um, on we've changed the model. We, we've used to do a lot of the, the training in person, but as we're doing more online, we've identified that um, if we've identified that, that, that now there's an opportunity to do the training on demand. So we do have an application online that you can go through the, all these pavement marking um, and signing uh, classes, which is really quick, takes about two hours to get through all of them um, uh, total, and it, it will really allow you to uh, to educate yourself to all of our products and what we're doing, and we'll also provide you with a PDH credit. And what's more important is that uh, from a quality perspective, we work with our contractors in New England to make sure that they're certified. So the pavement marking and signing co contractors, they get these certification cards. So don't hesitate to ask your contractors, uh, are you certified by the manufacturer of the material that you're putting down to make sure that they're doing the right thing and they're actively updating their knowledge to put the, the best product down at the best time. So let's get into the MUTCD. Um, obviously we can't cover all the MUTCD and this is uh, you know my interpretation. Uh, what it comes down to is, uh, is this book right here and uh, you know, Obviously, the book does not lie. Uh, the uh, the book in in the standards in it are what you you must uh, uh, basically adhere to, 
And so I'm just going to give you kind of our interpretation of, of some of these uh, high level things, and then we can kind of move on. So ultimately, your pavement marking standards, um, your pavement marking cannot exist without a sign, right? So it's important to have these things together. And they, these marking signs and signals that the METT talk, talks about, they convey these regulations, uh, guidance, and warnings. Um, and, 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 and it's important to, to adhere to them. So limitations on pavement markings. Ultimately, what we see during the day is the presence of the marking. We see the white. You know, we see the yellow. We don't see the, the reflectivity. That comes at night when the light from our car hits the pavement marking and comes back to the driver. That's the difference, right? But ultimately, that limit, these markings are limited. Visibility of them is limited if there's any kind of snow, debris, or water on top of them. Um, and then obviously the, the durability is changed with these uh, because of you know material characteristics, traffic volume, weather and location. And as a lot of you talked about, you know what are the pros and cons of different materials? What are the equipments? What are the techniques for painting that we might employ? So we'll talk more about that. So before um, pavement marking standards, obviously before in new uh, highway, private road, open to public travel, um, paved detour or temporary roads, open to travel, all necessary markings should be in place, right? So having a road that has lines on it is imperative. Without the lines, the road can be amazing, but it, people are gonna, are gonna speed, they're gonna go fast. We, we like to say, uh, put the icing on the cake, right? So the pavement markings are the icing and, uh, and the cake is, 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 is really looks good when the icing looks good. <laughs> So markings that are no longer applicable should be removed or obliterated as soon as possible. And you could use a temporary mask out tape, uh, approximately the same color as the pavement to achieve what you're doing, doing temporarily. New Hampshire uses a lot of temporary tape. We'll talk about that as we go. Pavement markings uh, that must be visible at night shall be retro reflective. Again, like I talked about light that goes into and back to the driver. All markings on interstate highways shall be retro reflective, meaning you have to have those beads in there. They need to have uh, some level of reflectivity. Right now, there's no uh, current levels of retro reflectivity, but we'll talk about that in coming slides. So the acceptability of the colors, uh, yellow, obviously for edge line, um, or double yellow in the middle, white edge line or skips, red for wrong way. Uh, we're starting to see that on the market. Blue for handicap. Purple, obviously toll roads, and I, I took that from Vermont, but uh, we do have a couple toll roads in New Hampshire. And then black is primarily for contrast or temporary covering up old markings. That's an important one as we, as we go. Colors, yellow longitudinal lines shall delineate separate, separation of that traffic line, uh, like we see down here in a, up opposing directions um, with a double yellow. The left hand uh, edge of roadways, divided highways and one-way streets or ramps and separation of two-way left turn lanes and reversible lanes in other directions. Colors, white longitudinal lines shall uh, delineate the separation of traffic uh, traveling in the same direction, uh, otherwise known as we call them skips, and then the right hand uh, uh, of the roadway over here. Okay. Next, we have red. Red uh, pavement markers are, are visible with a, a retroreflective device called an RPM uh, that typically is used in a recess in New England because if it was surface applied, as you might imagine, the, the plows would basically use these things as hockey pucks and shoot them all over the place. Um, they also have uh, wrong way delineation on guardrail and do not enters from a signing standpoint, but uh, red is really indicates ramps travel lanes that should not be entered using direction, using the, in the direction from which the markers are visible. Blue markings, as we said, uh, shall supplement white markings for parking spaces for persons with disabilities, purple markings for toll plazas. We're starting to see more toll plazas uh, marked with purple markings near them. Um, I can think of some in, uh, let's see, I think Massachusetts has had a couple. Black, we see more of the uh, combinations used to provide contrast. So the new METCD, which we'll talk about a little bit, 
uh, has some recommendations, a lot of recommendations that are both redundant from a, um, a visual, what we can see, making uh, contrast tape more visible on concrete because concrete whites out the marking. So having a black, either a tiger tail, a header behind the skip or uh, contrast on the edge, giving it more visibility uh, is important for contrast. And then obviously for black being used to uh, reduce visibility of a marking that you wanna temporarily cover up. And then uh, root shields, colors that are used in root shields. We see a lot in Massachusetts, not so much in New Hampshire uh, around placement of uh, root shields, primarily the interstate shields uh, in the, 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 the red, white, and blue. Um, and then you see some of these other configurations. They're primarily done in preformed thermoplastic. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So longitudinal lines, um, as we talked about um, your gores, when I talk about gores, we're talking about these 12 inch lines, typically your double yellow lines, your, your double yellow center of the lines, typically in a four, four, four inch pattern. Broken lines and skips that we see here, typically on the interstate with a 10, 20 uh, gap. And then dotted lane lines, um, cat tracks, like you see here in between on and off ramps, um, and then edge lines uh, that are visible. One thing that uh, MUTCD is looking at is upgrading um, road, on roads that are 45 miles an hour or higher, um, the edge lines on locals from four inch to six inch. That's a big one. And that one is one that, uh, again, the state of New Hampshire, uh, Bill Lambert, the state traffic engineer, and Eric Healy, the pavement marking engineer, they're preparing to uh, give comments back to Federal Highway on. Federal Highway has extended the uh, comment period till May 15th. So if there are any comments there from your perspective, you know, share with those guys and they can share with Federal Highway. Ultimately, the decision uh, is that the four inch line is not as visible as the six inch line. The six inch line is more visible to machine vehicles, machine vision, as well as uh, the human driver. So warrants for edge lines, right? Shall be placed on rural arterials with a traveled way of 20 feet or more and with an, an ADT average daily traffic of 6,000 vehicles a day. Should be placed on rural arterials or collectors with a travel way of 20 feet or more and width of ADT $3,000 3,000 vehicles a day. So again, the shall and the should are very important here, right? Shall is, uh, you know, it has to be done and should is, is, is you know, permissive. Uh, should be placed on other paved streets or highways where an engineering study indicates need. Center line. Center lines, they delineate the separation of traffic lanes uh, traveling in opposite directions. And these shall be yellow, as you, as you know. Uh, they're placed in at a center at a location that is not, it may be placed in the center at, at a location where it's not the geometric center of the, the roadway. Um, if it's if it's positioned off, if you don't want it on that scene, which is a, a good practice in general, not to put markings on the scene when the state specifies uh, placing a marking um, on some of the durable contracts, they place them two to four inches off the scene. That's a good trick to have so that when you go back and, you know, uh, basically uh, cover it up with, uh, see, with seal, you're not going to go over that marking. Short sections may be marked to control position of the traffic at certain locations. And uh, one way uh, yellow is not allowed. Warrants for center lines, it shall be placed on paved urban arterials and collectors with travels weigh 20 feet or more in width, uh, ADT 6,000 vehicles per or greater per day. They should be placed on all paved urban arterials and collectors with traveled way of 20 feet or more in width and ADT of 4,000 vehicles or greater a day. They should be placed on all pavement rural arterials and collectors with travels way of 18 feet or more in width and ADT of 3,000 vehicles a day. And then obviously, just like before, if there's an engineering study that indicates the need, you know, you're going, uh, you can pursue. If the road is 16 feet or less in width, it's not recommended. Um, potential for encroaching uh, traffic, encroaching on those pavement edges, parked vehicles, and oncoming traffic. 
as I said before, the placement of a single center lane um, marking uh, shall not be used on a two-way roadway. And, and obviously this shall be a double yellow line. Transverse marking, stop and yield lines. So we're talking about shoulder markings, word or symbols, uh, arrows, crosswalk lines, pavement parking spaces, speed measurement, speed hump. They should all be white uh, unless indicated otherwise. So uh, indicating the point uh, behind stop lines, they, they independent, indicate the point behind which the vehicle is required to stop in compliance with a uh, stop sign, an R-1 stop sign. Uh, stop here for pedestrian signs or some other traffic control device. They shall not be used at locations where drivers are required to yield and they consist of solid white lines extending across approach lanes, typically with 12 to 24 inches. Crosswalks. Crosswalk markings provide guidance for pedestrians who are crossing roadways by defining and delineating paths on approaches to and within uh, the signalized intersections. Um, and the crosswalk line shall consist of solid white lines, as you see here. A lot of cities and towns have moved to uh, the piano keys that you see here that I have circled. Um, from a visibility standpoint, um, uh, it's very consistent. And as the traffic uh, goes over the marking, the wheel paths can uh, tempo can can basically you can get more durability out of your line when the wheel paths are typically placed um, closer. Uh, when the wheels wheel paths uh, will potentially wear out some of these markings, you know, um, in where the wheels are, but you don't wear out some of the other ones. So from a durability standpoint, you can get a little more longevity out of these. Uh, crosswalks, new marked crosswalks al uh, alone without other measures designed to reduce traffic speeds, shorten crossing distance, enhance driver's awareness of the crossing and or provide active warnings of the pedestrian presence should not be installed across uncontrolled roadways where the speed limits excess 40 miles an hour and either the roadway has four or more lanes of travel without a raised median or uh, pedestrian refuge island and an ADT of 12,000 vehicles a day or greater, or the roadway has four or more lanes of travel uh, with a raised median and a pedestrian refuge island and ADT of 15,000 vehicles a day. Not applicable for New Hampshire. We don't have uh, four <laughs> lanes of, of traffic, uh, but just wanna make you guys aware of that. So colored pavement mark, uh, pavements located between the crosswalk lines should not use colors or patterns that degrade the contrast of the white crosswalk lines, or that might be mistaken uh, by road users as a traffic control application. So why can't you use the blue in here? Blue is for, as, we, as one of our earlier slides indicated, blue is for handicap. So that's sending the wrong message here, right? And same thing here, yellow is used for edge lines. It's not used for, uh, in, in double yellows, it's not used for crosswalks. So parking spaces, um, really the synopsis of this slide uh, says that there are some new designs uh, that have come out. And obviously with the new METCD, there will be some uh, additional designs that are coming, but just cause they look cool doesn't mean that they're compliant. So this is a non-standard symbol uh, that, that we've seen out there, you wanna make sure per MUTCD that you're using the MUTCD uh, version. And the pavement marking companies will give you essentially what you're asking for from a material standpoint, but the, um, the, the correct placement of these, uh, these symbols and markings should be to represent uh, what the MUTCD says. So the parking space boundaries encourage more orderly and efficient use of the parking spaces where parking turnover is substantial. Parking spaces shall be white and blue lines may supplement white parking space markings um, of parking spaces designated for use only by people with disabilities. Arrow markings. Uh, as you can see, these are the standard type arrows. There's a lot of different designs. Again, you wanna reference what MUTCD uh, does. And I think New Hampshire, as with other states, New Hampshire DOT has a stencil crew. If you ever wanted to get more from an equipment standpoint, 
get uh, some new symbols made, you could probably reach out to Eric um, with New Hampshire DOT and get a hold of his symbols and uh, make some new ones of your, your own for your crew, if you're looking. So at this point, we're gonna transition over to Paul. He's gonna talk a little bit about what a lot of you guys are familiar with, the paint and thermoplastic. So Paul, Fantastic. you are Can I interrupt quickly, yeah, Paul and Mike, sure. if you don't mind? We had one question. I thought um, maybe it might help to, to touch on this one um, before we transition over to Paul. The question was in regards to tiger tails. Can you explain what, what those markings are a bit further? Sure, sure. So tiger tails are, and is my camera working again here? Is it visible? It, it, well, so I actually found your video and I highlighted it. So folks should be able to see it now. So skips are typically white. Uh, I'm showing this picture in my video. And then a tiger tail is actually the beginning or the end of the skip. If you can see my picture here, uh, that's black. And so there's a black indication on concrete in say Colorado, they have problems with their, their white blending into the con concrete. So what they do is they put black markings at the beginning and or the end of the white skip to indicate a tiger tail. Another way to do contrast for the machine vision is to do a tape or visible marking skip that has the black on the outsides of the marking, right? So it's more visible to humans. It's more visible to vehicles as well. Hopefully that explains the, the tiger tail, which is again, the, the marking before or after the skip. It's primarily done for skips uh, in between lanes. It's not done on the edge line as much. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for the interruption or allowing that there. No, 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 that's perfect, perfect. Uh, so should we transition to Paul? That sounds good. If there are any other questions, folks, feel free to put them in the chat pod or unmute yourself. But I think I was in that. Yeah, Paul, come on on stage. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Paul. I'm going to take you guys through pavement markings here. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. Someone asked about uh, retro uh, reflectivity, which we talk about a lot at 3M. Uh, so this is a Kind of a depiction of a typical glass bead that you might see being applied to thermoplastic uh, latex paint um, any standard markings um, and typically what it's meant to do and mike brought this up earlier is um, add reflectivity so at night um, you know that line needs to be reflective so that it can delineate drivers um, so this is your standard 1.5 uh, index glass bead uh, so under normal conditions, light enters the optic and then retroreflects off the back of the optic back to the origin. So it's returning to the original light source. Now, now things can happen. Um, beads can get nicked up, uh, can crack, can kind of disperse some of that light. Uh, a big piece that we talk about a lot, and we'll dis discuss this more, in this uh, presentation is, is wet reflectivity. Um, if you've ever been on a rural road uh, at night in the rain, you, you will notice that markings tend to disappear a little bit more. Uh, we do have optics uh, called all, all 3M all-weather elements, um, as well as our all-weather preformed tapes, which have higher refractive index uh, optics as a part of their system. So what happens there is that light uh, bends through the water in a certain way that allows that line to be seen easier as that light is reflecting back to the uh, original source, which is the headlight. So that's a little bit about uh, retroflectivity. We could touch uh, a lot more on that. It's a big topic. Um, so if there's any questions at the end, please let me know. Uh, but uh, we can go to the next slide here, Mike. Um, so whenever you're talking about durable markings, um, you're, you're always going to try to consider snow plows. So I, I live in Minnesota, so this is definitely a big one. Uh, you don't talk to uh, anybody about durable markings or re reflectivity or in increasing any of those things on your roadways without talking about, well, how does it hold up the snow plows? And as you can see on the right, that picture, um, that gnarly looking plow just ate up that edge line pretty darn good. Um, so especially depending on the types of types of plows that your, your city might be running or the type of plow blades uh, that can make a big, uh, a big impact. So we do talk a lot about different application methods and different materials 
uh, that can maybe hold up more to the type of weather that we get in our states. And we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more, but clouds are definitely the biggest one. Next slide, Mike. So this is just an overview of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, we'll go through different materials. Uh, we'll talk about surfaces, the different application methods, uh, the, the properties of these different materials and the optics um, inspections, and then a little bit about uh, the durability and longevity along with different installations that will uh, kind of support that. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier, we, we also promote a lot of, of grooving. Now this is one method of getting your markings below uh, the surface of the roadway to kind of protect them from plows. And this is just a look at some of the different pieces of equipment or uh, parts of your equipment that might do that installation. Um, and this is just to look at uh, kind of the changes in grooving technology. Um, on the left, there's the old version. These are these type of uh, grinders pulverize the road more so than kind of saw it out. So you can see that picture there to the right of that saw blade that uh, Mike just circled. You can kind of see that it's, it's textured, it's kind of rough. Um, and that's from kind of a crushing uh, aspect that those uh, grinders do perform. And then there's a cross section cut below that and you can see how it kind of goes up and down and waves a little bit. The new grinders on the right, they give you more of a uniform uh, flat groove with, with smaller ridges so that more of the material can lay flat and make contact with the bottom of that groove. So you're, and those are called gang stack diamond heads. It's just sharper and that gives you a more uniform groove um, at the bottom of that. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just a look at the different services that we'll deal with. Um, on New Hampshire roadways, you know, on the right, asphalt's definitely a big one and the different types underneath that. Um, higher ADT roads, you'll see uh, cast in place and precast concrete slabs. Um, and it's important to consider all these things as that will kind of dictate, you know, that's a telltale sign of ADT and maybe the type of pavement marking material you'll want to use on that roadway. Um, you know, one example of that is, you know, the different types of HMA that you can come across. Um, and the open grade friction course, uh, which is more porous if you're dealing with a less hardy pavement marking, like, like a paint, you know, on that initial uh, surface of that road, that's going to bleed a little bit more and a lot of that material might kind of soak into the surface of that roadway versus gap graded, which is more dense. Um, it's going to hold and you'll get better um, uh, initial road presence with, with that type of roadway. So next slide, Mike. And then another consideration, you know, application, or excuse me, climate impacts, which can affect the initial application and also the longevity of that pavement marking. Uh, like I said earlier, in our states, we get all types of weather, super hot summers. Uh, winters, especially this winter, can be uh, pretty pretty crazy with, with snow and extreme cold and everything like that. Um, you know, we all hope for 75 degrees and, and light wind with a, you know, sunny skies and dry weather. Um, but things to take, keep into account, um, you know, when's the last time it rained, um, how hot is the surface, uh, humid, humidity, um, and all of these things will also uh, kind of direct us towards possibly the type of material we're going to use in a certain time period within the year. Next slide, Mike. So this is a nice visual, um, kind of gives you a visual of the hierarchy of the different pavement markings that we see used uh, across different states um, in relation to their durability. So paint, uh, primarily due to cost, is used most frequently. Um, definitely the least durable uh, material. And then as you work your way up the triangle and things narrow, uh, we get into thermoplastic uh, two-part liquid systems, which are uh, better, more durable, more hardy options over paint. And then at the top, we've got um, 3M all-weather stay mark tape, um, which is the most durable. And on the flip side, we reverse that and we can see tape, most durable, and then it narrows down and funnels down to paint 
where we get the least amount of durability. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about uh, touch quickly on uh, paint. Um, so the big one here is is the the mill thickness and its its ability to kind of grip and hold on to any sort of optics that are added to that material. So you guys will notice right away. I mean, a lot of local agencies that I speak to, uh, paint is kind of a necessity just because it's very available and it's it's very affordable. But if it's service supplied, you might get one year. You know, depending on when you apply it within the year, it could be gone in in five or six months. You know, if it's a late season install, um, it's it's gone the following spring. Um, and a lot of that's due to the mill thickness, you know, 15, 17, that'll dry up and shrink down to, you know, 13, and it's not clinging onto those glass beads quite as much. Um, and along with that, it, it's just not, not a very hardy material. Um, overall road presence along with reflectivity can kind of get nicked up and dinged up. Um, but still, there's a time and place for paint. Um, and in the bottom right corner there, got the different item numbers for the different uh, widths. For, for New Hampshire DOT, uh, latex paint pavement markings. Um, and then really the way paint uh, adheres to the roadway is it just evaporates and it dries and it just adheres to the surface of the road. And uh, some larger agencies will have striping trucks and they'll get really aggressive with their paint striping. Uh, some of you guys might have experience with doing touch up work and doing uh, stencil work around intersections with a push cart uh, Mike's highlighting the, uh, the Graco unit up in the top right. Um, so we can go to the next slide there, Mike. Um, so paint, I mean, what's nice about it is you can reapply it over uh, previous paint, over tape, over thermoplastic. So it's available and, and very useful in that regard. Um, again, we kind of talked about the climate impacts in, in perfect conditions. It can dry pretty fast. You know, in the summertime, if you hit some nice weather, uh, you can certainly uh, expect it to dry quicker than uh, other conditions. So 40 degrees Fahrenheit and rising um, is, is typically the lowest you'd want to install that type of material. Uh, but some agencies have actually taken a closer look at, for example, excuse me, example, uh, 3M's LPM 5000, which is a two component uh, polyurea material which can be installed down to 30 degree temperatures. Um, we've got some really cool videos from South Dakota uh, where this material was installed and there's snow on the shoulder of the road. It, it looks like a time of year where you'd never see a liquid, uh, a liquid marking go down, but this stuff holds up pretty darn well when it's cold. So in, in certain instances where you're in a pinch where you need to do a, a late season application, uh, there's a fantastic option. Um, in that polyurea material. Hey, can I add something? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so this truck that you guys are seeing up here, uh, the one agency in New England, uh, one local agency that I know of that has a truck is Manchester, New Hampshire. So they got this new truck from MB a couple of years ago. They do their long lines. I don't know if anyone from Manchester is on the call. If you are, you guys can, uh, someone can jump on and just say hi. But uh, this truck is, uh, has been retrofit, um, you know, and cleaned up uh, basically every, every, every year they go back in and kind of clean the pumps and get things fired up so that, uh, you know, Tom and the crew can get it going for the following year. Um, ultimately, they're spraying latex paint and they're using a standard type one glass bead on it. Um, but they're getting uh, decent durability and longevity and the, the benefit of having their own truck is that they can, they can manage their lines a little bit better. And the, the beauty of having a smaller chassis uh, uh, with this type of equipment is that they can get in and out of the, um, the intersections. So I was on the truck one day and we literally got to a, an intersection and just did a, did a complete UE in the intersection to get back on to start doing long line again. So it was pretty neat to see. From an equipment standpoint, owning your own truck is very, very big deal. Uh, for the most part, most of you guys are using the hand carts like Paul showed on that previous uh, slide. You all are asking about equipment. Uh, Titan makes hand carts. Graco makes hand carts. Uh, Graco is by far the, the industry leader, but uh, those are your options when it comes to equipment. Back to you, Paul. 
I think we have Tom on the call. It looks like Tom might have unmuted himself. Good morning, okay. Tom. If you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah. To Tommy, what's up? Not much, buddy. Yeah, how's, I mean, how's the truck? Went over with the truck is good. Um, you know, we go back um, years from when I started. You know, 40 years we've had our own truck. So, you know, this is obviously a, a new unit, uh, three years old now, and it's worked out really well for us. Would you recommend it to other towns or cities? What are the the big big pluses and minuses with owning your own truck? I mean, the big plus. I mean, what what we've transitioned to recently, you know, in the last couple of years, is when there's a, a contract, a paving contract, the contractor will do the long line striping after the paving, whereas years prior, um, we did most of our own paving. And so we were putting all the new striping in. So we're just doing restriping mostly now, and then some, you know, reinstallation of a uh, edge line, double yellow. Um, so what we find is, you know, nothing against the contractors, but we find our putting lines down ourselves, we can manage it a lot better and they can last a lot longer than the contractor lines do. Yeah. No, that's 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 important to know. I think uh, making sure that you have the the right equipment and 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 the right uh, being able to manage the maintenance contracts and the year to year maintenance is is different than doing new new asphalt, right? And being able to uh, to manage that maintenance piece is is really good. From a material standpoint, any recommendations with the the latex paint and the glass beads? Any any drop rates or recommendations you guys might have that could help these guys? We, we try to uh, stick with, you know, DOT specs and uh, uh, six pounds per gallon. You know, we try to stick with that uh, for beads. And um, we have our truck pretty tuned up. So, uh, you know, we're good to go. We just get out there, do a test line in the morning, and then we're gone. You yep. Know. Yep. And it sprays different than a, a hand cart. There's so much more pressure coming out of your truck. I mean, it's a brand new truck. So, uh, you know, for agencies that are looking for big, big purchases, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, roughly, what did you pay for the truck, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it was around 300000 Okay. Yeah. So it's a big, it's a capital expense. Uh, and from an, from a, from a standpoint of, uh, you know, having, a, having the right operator, any recommendations there to towns, cities? Well, you know, that's that's the, uh, oh, excuse me, hold on. That's the tricky part sometimes with the operators is uh, guys coming in and in and out, you know, whereas uh, in the past we had the same guy for years and, you know, just training new operators is, is kind of tough. But with this truck, it's, it's pretty simple, you know, and, uh, so, you know, we got a new driver now and he, he picked it up in one year. Uh, so you, you saw it. I mean, with the cab over, you have uh, vision, you can see everything good. You can turn that thing on a dime. So, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty good. Good. Well, I appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, uh, Tom Bazoin is the... Uh is a supervisor in Manchester. And, and uh, Tom, if you want to put your contact information or your email in the chat, uh, if anyone is interested, they can reach out to you if that's okay. Sure, no problem. Sounds good. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. All right. So we'll take a closer look at uh, thermoplastic here. Um, thermoplastic, definitely a, a hardier uh, marking uh, than, than paint. You can see application um, mills around 125. So in that picture there kind of does it justice. You can see those glass beads as well as some of the, uh, those are actually 3M all weather elements. Um, so with thicker mill thicknesses like that, um, as they cure and dry, uh, they, they grip onto those optics and elements a little bit better uh, over other markings. Um, you know, we definitely see a lot of this in Minnesota, um, pull up to an intersection, you'll see these types of markings in the groove. Uh, they hold up pretty darn good around intersections. A um, little bit warmer uh, surface or uh, temperature for application. 
Um, and then it, it cools and hardens and, and uh, we'll take a look on the next slide here, Mike, if you want to transition. Kind of uh, what you can expect at the bottom of these photos here, uh, they kind of dries and cracks, but the overall road presence is still really good. Um, that's one thing that I hear a lot about uh, this thermo thermoplastic material is that uh, overall road presence over time, pretty darn good. Um, and then it's it's important to consider you know the types of thermoplastic you know what's what's in the truck if you're going from hydrocarbon to alkyd uh, you got to clean it out uh, you, you, before switching those materials otherwise you're gonna have trouble at the time of application. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide here, Mike. Actually, let's hang on. Let's um, let's see if Jeff from Portsmouth is available. Jeff, he has uh, his own equipment for oh, doing perfect. long for doing uh, intersection work. Uh, for thermoplastic. Jeff, do you have any recommendations to guys that are, might be looking at handwork with thermoplastic? Well, Jeff, we might still have you muted. It looks like you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Maybe your microphone's not connected. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, it, Jeff, if you come back on, just uh, let us know. We can we can hop back to this this slide, but we're going to talk next about preformed thermo. All right. So this material, the preformed thermo, um, some of you might have experience with this. Um, I know we're seeing more and more of it and, and 3M's getting a little more involved with this type of material as well. Um, everything comes all in one. I mean, this material will, will have the optics already on the uh, preformed uh, symbol or legend that you receive. And then it can be uh, installed with a torch. Uh, so as long as you've got a clean uh, road surface without any cracks, I mean, this can go down um, in a lot of different uh, symbols and le legends in, in a lot of different areas of your town. Um, as you can see, it's got a, a thinner uh, mill thickness. So as far as, you know, creating an edge for a plow to nick up, it's a little bit lower profile. Um, and this is something that, you know, cities and towns can go out and install themselves with, with not a lot of equipment and use around schools, intersections, you know, parking lots. That's definitely a big one. Uh, we can go to the next slide here, Mike, and we'll go into a little bit more. You know, and one thing I want to point out is all the different colors that this stuff comes in. I mean, you can do handicap symbols. Uh, bike lanes seem to keep trending up. Uh, so these are all things that, you know, cities and towns could take advantage of, touch up these types of areas with this material. Uh, now, this this lineup here is 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 a material that we're getting more invested in. Um, this is preformed thermoplastic. And uh, you can see it comes in different roles. Uh, you can select the different arrows um, for, for different types of intersection applications. In the bottom left, you can kind of see the different outlines of different crosswalks and yellow center lines. So really quite diverse, the different types of markings that you can install. Um, and then some of the properties of this material, like I said, the uh, reflective component, um, all the glass beads are already installed on the surface of that material, uh, skid resistant, and then just need a torch and a, a clean roadway surface and you're off to the races. So more to, more to come on some of this stuff, um, but definitely very exciting. Um, Mike, anything you wanted to add on the preformed thermoplastic line? No, just the uh, the fact that you know it's it's gaining a lot of popularity. Um, you know, it's a little bit thinner than standard thermoplastic, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it's it's a pretty easy install. Um, yeah, Is this working, it's, Mike? it's practical. Yeah. Oh, there you are, Jeff. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, Jeff, give us some uh, some feedback. Let me go back a couple of slides. Jeff from Portsmouth, everybody. Jeff, tell us what your experience with the thermo uh, cart has been. It's uh, it's amazing, honestly. Uh, I prefer it. I'd rather use that over paint any day um, for crosswalks and stop bars, at least. Um, 
<clears throat> it just lasts so much longer. Uh, there is an art to it with um, uneven and cracked roads. Uh, yep. I've learned over the years to have it hotter or colder uh, for certain, you know, un un uneven or cracked, again, uh, push it like hell. Um, so it doesn't run everywhere, but it's still better than paint. Like you were saying, we do the piano keys and the car tracks might wipe out one or two bars, uh, yep. and, it, and you know, and they might have to touch them up, you know, um, at a minimum once a year, but I mean, I mean, at a maximum once a year, but sometimes two, three years, uh, especially on the newer pavement. Um, I just, I, like I said, I just prefer it. It lasts. Um, I make, I can make it, you know, kind of so I can rotate throughout the city instead of doing everything all once year. I, I can't, I can't do it all in one year. Yeah. Uh, so you use it primarily for crosswalks and stop bars? Yes. Yep. And have yeah. you used it for symbols or legends or have you used any of the preform for that? <clears throat> uh, honestly, I haven't had time. Got it. I just bust out the crosswalks and the stop bars. I've done a few arrows, but not, but not many. Yeah. Uh, you know, we will tend to, um, I just run out of time. So yeah. last, last season, uh, we also used, um, an outside vendor to come in and do some arrows, uh, do some of the big intersections that take me. We just got a kettle, um, 650 pound kettle. Uh, it's great. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, we just had the Graco Pro Melt which melts its own bags, which is a good start. But, you know, when you're trying to do such a large amount, uh, when you do a big, like a double bar intersection, uh, that's four lanes wide, you just have to wait for bags to melt. Whereas with the kettle, you know, just as soon as we build a machine, we throw the bags in and they're melted by the next time. So it, it is saved so much time. So how many machines do you have and what are the names of them and what do they cost roughly? Uh, I have two of the Graco Pro Melts. Uh, I think they were like, shit, I don't even remember, maybe 15 grand with the 12 inch dies. Yep. Um, and then I'm trying to order, uh, I think it's the, the 200, the TC 200, the Graco. And the only reason I'm going with Graco is because that's what we already have. That's what yep. a guy near us fixes. So, um, you know, the, the company that came here last year used the Titan. And the only reason I'm, I'd like to switch is the ProMelt fully loaded with thermo and beads, 30 pound tank on the front, about, I think, 870 pounds. Yeah. So on, a, on an incline is a workout. <laughs> uh, how do you manage the heat? Thermoplastic is applied for three, 400 degrees hot. Whereas paints and polys are, you know, in the hundred. Yeah. Um, honestly, yeah, I go around 375. The thermostat on those, as they get older, kind of runs a little high, a little low. So I have one of those infrared thermometers I just check as I'm stirring it to make sure. Um, <clears throat> but it's just, I mean, you can just start and go right across the road. It's, it's cured in, in no time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a matter of getting your guys accustomed to it, working with it, having the right material on hand, but it's definitely more durable than paint. Way, way more. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Any other comments? Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, the thermo, I mean, what I, what I found it, we have, so we talked about how, the new pavement, we have contractors come in, so we, we haven't thermal put in for all of that. But what I'm finding is, um, even even though it's more durable, you know, the turn lanes and everything get worn down every year, and the reflectivity is not there. So, you know, we have to go back anyways. So I, I don't know, to me, you know, the difference, the price with thermo, is is better than than paint. I mean, we have if we have to go back and restripe it every year, anyways. Then then I don't know that it's a, now. What I also found is if it's recessed, 
it's a thousand times better. Right. So, I mean, that's yeah, just so my... A couple of comments there, Tom. I think generally speaking, the thermo in a recess, like you see in the picture, is definitely going to protect the optics better, right? As thermo wears, it cracks, and, you know, Jeff can attest to it. It, it has good presence. So as you're driving during the day, it's still going to be visible. Thermo does not do wet reflectivity well, so that's why you need the elements. And it doesn't do retain dry high that well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But generally speaking, the, the presence is, when you go to thermo, you're going to get presence year over year compared to, to paint. Is that is that a fair assessment there, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, it lasts, again, so much longer here in our instance, um, you know, with single lanes and turns and uh, the downtown, um, you know, we, we go in there with paint and it's gone, the beads are gone, it uh, has no reflectivity. Um, and then you're trying to be in the middle of the road in an intersection at six o'clock in the morning, you know, when cars are barreling through on their phones and I can go through, you know, at night and just zip through and then it's done. And I don't have to go back that year. And if I do have to go back the next year, it's pretty much a touch up. Once in a while, the plows, uh, or I should say the greater downtown does a number on them, but um, this has been a great year for that not happening. Any other comments, anyone? What do you use, Tom, what do you use for paint where you're getting better? Um, like how many mills you put it down or um, as far as, you know, getting a longevity out of it compared to the thermal? We're we're at like fifteen to seventeen, and we we go with the uh, state bid. So it's it's most of the time it's been Ennis, because uh, you know price wise you're not going to beat them. Yeah, waterborne. Like yes. Yeah. 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 So you know I, I think there might be a good opportunity to kind of take that off take some more conversation offline between uh, Portsmouth and and Manchester. You guys are two big cities that have a lot more durability, a lot more. ADT than the rest of these guys. So um, maybe for the, the sake of the call, we'll just let you guys take the, the rest of the conversation offline if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. But thank Thanks. you guys. Uh, you, your, your comments, your input is, is critical here as, you know, not every city in town is going to be able to, you know, buy a long line truck or a thermal uh, applicator. The challenge is how do we, um, how do we actively, you know, make recommendations for uh, materials that potentially contractors are going to be doing, or if the cities and towns in New Hampshire are going to upgrade to what, what equipment can they upgrade to? So Paul, any final comments before we move? Um, good discussion. Thank, thank you guys for your input. Um, you know, that's kind of the, uh, the ongoing uh, goal is what's, what's the, What's the silver bullet to, to keep markings on the ground, you know, on coming into intersections and there's different ways of going about it. Um, so really good, good discussion, but no, no, Mike, I think that, I think that went well and uh, yeah, we can keep moving along here. Good. Mike, do you mind if I add just one um, quick comment to this? I kind of popped it in the chat pod, but for our local agencies, one of the conversations we're, we're hoping to have some in-depth dialogue on is how to use shared purchasing, group purchasing, or, um, shared equipment opportunities. So um, something like a roadside mower or a, a pavement marking machine that might be um, something you don't use routinely, uh, but it's nice to have it available. Can you partner with other municipalities to look at those group purchases to make something available for shared use? So we've got a couple conversations on the calendar about that. Um, this, this idea came up during our conversation last year on rural road safety and reducing roadway departures and the importance of lines um, yeah. at safety efforts. So definitely check that out and join us if you're thinking about this type of equipment, but it's it's not in your, your single town budget. Maybe there are some other ways to work together to try to leverage those opportunities. Yeah, that's a great point, Marley. I mean, the challenge with a lot of this equipment is that the it's expensive. You know, pavement marking equipment is expensive and uh, and typically, you know, you look at these two big trucks that are that are here. I mean, uh, on the screen, these are these are the workhorses in the industry right now. The grinding trucks that are doing 
you know, significant removal and recessing markings. We're at the point where contractors now have three, four of these grinding trucks up top. And then, you know, polyurea and plural component trucks down below, they're getting to the point where they're, they're starting to look at their second one or, or, or refreshing and getting a new one. So, yeah, if there are those conversations, uh, you know, from a material stand, from an equipment standpoint, that that's something that you guys, some of the big cities may want to engage in, but it's, it's not easy to, 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 to move the equipment. I mean, just to do the work that these guys need to do and, and, in the city that, you know, you heard it from Jeff, it's hard for him to even get all his work done. And Tom would say the same thing. It's very difficult to get all the uh, long line and, and, and symbols and legends done in these big cities because there's just so many requests. So uh, may, that, that's why it's important to talk about the difference of the materials, the specifications that you might wanna update and, uh, and we'll, we'll continue to have that conversation. So I'm gonna cruise here for a couple of minutes to see if we can get to the end. Um, Retro reflectivity, right? Paul talked about it briefly. Uh, Federal Highway is considering these, these numbers on greater than or equal to 55 mile an hour roads, 250 and 100. And over here, that's kind of what you, you can see. You know, what do you feel would be comfortable from a, a, a visibility standpoint uh, in your contract saying to a contractor, yeah, or uh, we, want, we want 200 or 150 millicandelas. And how do you measure that, right? So the state calls for it on their contracts. They're measured with a retro reflectometer, this guy right here. And if you ask for that, for dry reflectivity, 200 millicandelas, uh, 150 millicandelas, you're gonna get a minimum level of reflectivity. And that's important, right? Um, that's important uh, to, to call for that and to have that. Um, reflectivity is measured at, on our state jobs in both dry and wet. So there's a minimum level of both wet and dry reflectivity uh, per ASTM that you could refer back to. So I'll give you some of that information. And as you might imagine, your reflectivity, the higher you go with your initial, you know, uh, your, your, your higher retained is gonna stay, right? The second, like Paul said, the second the plows get on paint, that surface applied, your marking goes from, you know, say 300 to 100 instantly because it just shaves off a lot of the markings. So by recessing, by using a durable liquid, uh, a polyurea, a thermoplastic, you're going to have a little more retained reflectivity. And retained reflectivity equates to uh, increased crash redu reduction. So from a safety standpoint, it makes sense for you to think about what type of beads am I using? Am I using type 1? type two or type three. When you go with type one, it's the cheapest. They're the smallest, but they don't let as much light back. When you go to type three beads or elements, you know, like you see here, elements that, that um, enhance and are used uh, by the state for uh, double drop. When you go to a double drop, you're gonna get, like you can see over here, there's two sets of, of beads going off, right? When you get double drop behind your paint, you're gonna get more reflectivity, provided that they embed in the liquid and it's thick enough to grab it. Like Paul said, if you're going on an open graded mix, you wanna put thicker material down. Don't be afraid to go you know, 20 mils uh, in certain situations. 18 mils is probably more realistic. City of Portland goes 18 mils and they call for eight pounds drop rate of glass beads. So they go a little bit heavier with their, with their paint. But using some of these things, accessing uh, wet reflectivity, there have been studies that have done that have showed that wet reflectivity is significant. It's going to, uh, Federal Highway has looked and studied it to say that uh, these detection distances for uh, rainy night is, is important. And so agencies for um, secondary roads have seen 46 and 41% reduction in crashes. And on interstate, you know, 12% because of wet reflectivity. So not all your markings are created equal. And, and so the elements, the, the optics that we make, we have a blend that is dry, uh, that maximize light back to the driver in dry conditions, and then an element that's wet. And it sends light through the water back to the driver. And so they are dropped typically in a double drop system where you have elements that go first and then glass beads that go second after your liquid. And then uh, 
basically you'll 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 see that the markings are holding up a little bit better and the, the markings are a little bit more durable so a plural component uh, material that we talk about frequently is polyurea um, which is a fast dry material and then slower dry epoxy you got city of lebanon and hanover that have used durable polyurea dover has used some um, some epoxy on crosswalks and stop bars it can be recessed or surface applied um, and typically it's around 25 mils to 30 mils on open graded like you see here it's a two compart two two part uh, process that goes down in a mixed chamber and and hardens instantly like bondo so the benefits of of polyurea are that regardless of the temperature it's going to dry instantly and give you no tracking reflectivity that the state calls for here is pretty high for both dry and wet so that gives higher retained numbers these are the New Hampshire DOT specification numbers for the polyurea. Uh, continuing along, these trucks are dedicated polyurea or epoxy. They're not, you can't go back and forth. The material like paint is super low profile, so it dries very quickly. So with a polyurea, you don't need coning. You can do live striping with an attenuator as you see on the interstate. Uh, with epoxy, it's significantly slower. It could be up to an hour in cold weather. Um, and typically you're going to do it um, with a contractor. So what do the machines see? Machine vision uh, with a lot of these METCD recommendations. Machines are looking for three things. They're looking for luminance, which is the difference in the, the, the white and the black top. They're looking for contrast, the difference between the marking and that, that substrate. So the pixelization of the white, the contrast of the marking to the background, and then wet reflectivity, right? Uh, luminance in, implies dry reflectivity here. So those are the components that we see today that are redundant to what the machine's seeing of, of tomorrow. Um, the next type of material is durable tape. Durable tape can be inlaid, grooved, or surface applied. Inlaid hot, so as you're paving the road, you put it down. Um, grooved, where you're actually recessing it below the surface and surface applied. We've done some surface applied stuff right in front of New Hampshire DOT uh, on Hayes and Drive. They typically come in pre-pattern uh, mixes like you see here. Everything comes out of factories with retroreflectivity in it. Typically, there's a warranted uh, two years for symbols and legend, four years for long line. So none of the other products typically have a warranty with them with paint because the contractor or the agency is controlling the installation, whereas the manufacturer uh, controls the reflectivity that's built into this thing. The two types of tape that New Hampshire allows for level one, wet reflective, the 380 all weather uh, that has both wet and ref, wet and dry reflectivity in a four year wet continuous 50 millicandela um, warranty. And then level two tapes that are used primarily for um, locations where there is overhead lighting. So level two would be for intersections where you want that dry reflectivity Wet isn't as important. Level one is for long line type application. And here are your New Hampshire DOT numbers down here. New Hampshire is using tape in a couple of different applications. We're using them in, as a third skip supplement on 293 in Manchester. We're using them, uh, this is an example from that installation where they're putting mini skips in. Agencies and locals could do this uh, for intersections, going through intersections where markings typically disappear. You could use them as a supplement to your long lines in areas that are, are, um, are typically where you see a lot of accidents. From a reflectivity standpoint, we've had tape on roads in Massachusetts where we get significant snow plow damage and uh, significant uh, snow plow wear and, and heavy traffic with the reflectivity of the material still in the 188 to 264, eight years later. Um, and there's still a wet continuous component to it. So it's, it's to know that the product will hold up if it's installed correctly. Heating it up, uh, applying tape hot, really your sweet spot is the 130 to 160 degree temperature of when that paver goes through and the compactor roller goes down. At that point, you're going to put the tape into the road. And for any towns or cities that want to try this, they can reach out to me. Um, easy to do stop bars and crosswalks where you get roughly um, 20, sorry, about 40 to 50% embedment, like you see here in the aggregate. Best 
uh, scenario for local agencies because they can they can do the work and have the marking uh, on the road as the roads open. Uh, last scenario with tape is recessing, like you see here. This is actually from uh, from Vermont, but you can see if you were to recess the tape like we did on the Derry, uh, New Hampshire bridge decks, uh, it's totally protected, and uh, and you're going to get that durability. The next type of material uh, is our uh, temporary raised pavement marker. A lot of you guys are familiar with these. You call them TOMS and they're great for secondary roads. Uh, New Hampshire DOT standard is, uh, they cannot be used on interstate or high, weed, high, high speed multi-lane highways. Um, they're cheap. Uh, they, they typically have a little bit of reflective up here on the top and they adhere to the road for uh, long enough to, for you to get the, the striping crews out. Another option for you that the interstate um, calls for is the wet reflective removable tape. This tape is typically folded on the top edge here uh, away from traffic so that the contractors can go back and peel it up when it's done. They're usually used with skip um, as mini skips uh, to temporarily line the road once the paving has been done. Uh, 50 degrees and rising from an application standpoint and um, it is wet reflective. It also comes in a blackout tape. The benefit of the blackout is uh, when you scarify these roads, we call it ghost lines. And so when you're driving at night and you see this ghost line, your car wants to go, you know, this way, wants to go, wants to follow the ghost line. But with wet reflective tape or with blackout tape, you would cover this, this grind up and uh, you'd be able to see that your lines are staying uh, you know, you, you want to keep yourself in the lines. And that's very important for vehicle um, automation as well, because vehicles and automation um, with the cameras that are on the cars now, they're, they're looking for uh, some interesting things. And, and there's been situations where people have been driven, the, the car has actually driven them right into the, the, the drums because the car sees one thing and, and the, the person sees another. So wet reflectivity is here to stay. There are a lot of technologies that you can use. As we kind of wrap up these last four minutes, we'll talk about inspection. And I'm sure none of your lines look like this in, in New Hampshire, but uh, uh, they're definitely not uh, Tasmanian devils in the state, but who knows, maybe some possums. So uh, most important thing about inspection is really just being on site, talking to them, uh, the contractor ahead of time, um, doing a, a, an installation, uh, you know, a recommend, just a check-in beforehand, like a pre-con meeting, right? What do you plan to do? How many guys are you throwing at it? Uh, what are your hours of work? And what, what should we expect? Are you going to have someone behind you coning off? You're going to have someone with an attenuator. Make sure these are detailed in your specification and or talked about ahead of time. Having a pre-con meeting and talking about these things ahead of time will save you a lot of hassle, as you might imagine. If you just let these guys come in and do their thing, who knows what's going to happen. Um, one good thing to do uh, is really that we call for on the interstate jobs is to conduct an on-site drop rate calibration. And that means you're, you're going to get a little sample of what they're going to put down on a piece of tar paper, like you can see in my, my, my camera here. They're going to spray it with the glass beads. They're going to spray it down and you're going to have a little sample to walk around the entire town or city with and say, this is ultimately what we, we agreed to when you did the sample and this should be consistent across the, the town. And what you'll see is consistent application of beads, consistent application of width of the liquid marker, right? These are some of the things that you'd want to uh, ensure you're getting to make sure it's a quality installation. So getting on your hands and knees and looking at the, the width of the line and make sure, making sure you're getting what you're paying for. Looking at uh, the reflectivity with the sun behind you, uh, with your camera, so you can see that the lines are indeed reflective, right? Because at night you can see the reflectivity, but during the day you typically can't see that. Avoiding the seam, right? This is very important. Um, as you avoid the seam and you put markings off the seam, you're not gonna crack seal over them in the future. And uh, we're getting a lot of the interstate uh, recommendations and repaving to this point, but um, where they're not putting the, the skips and the edge lines on the, on the seams, but uh, uh, from a local road perspective, I think we're still working on it. 
So these are just some quick takeaways, um, you know, and I can share these with the group, but ultimately these are things that you might see in the field that uh, from paint or polyurea standpoint or epoxy, if there are issues you can address in the field, right? If the pattern's surging, what are some of the issues potentially? Pressure, the power's low, the suction's leaking, filters clogged, you know, the spray hose is too small. Pump strokes are very common with epoxy and polyurea if the mixing chambers are not mixing correctly, right? Um, if the lines are too, too, too thin and it's too thick in the middle, right? These are things that you wanna stop the contractor and have that conversation with. And if you have an inspector, great. If you don't, again, get, get a sample uh, from them ahead of time and agree to them, agree with them that this is a good representation of what's on the road. With thermoplastic, uh, there are other issues that, you know, uh, that come up, you know, potentially bubbles in the lines. There might be some solvent or moisture trapped in the line. Material might be overheated. Uh, some ruffling, uh, ruff, roughening pitted lines or crumbly edges, there might be issues there. So things that you can point to the contractor. The real important one is reflectivity, right? The proper application of beads is uniform application across that line, not heavy to one side, not, you know, bubbles in the line or not, uh, you know, reflectivity on the outside to the line. They're consistently through the middle. And the proper embedment is 55 to 60 percent. You know, if the material is too hot, like you see here, they're gonna the, the optics are gonna disappear, and you're not gonna get reflectivity. If the material is too cold, then they're not gonna get embedded deep enough, and you're gonna put your hand across that marking, and all the optics are gonna fall right off. And then if there's too many beads, you know, there is situations where you can put too many beads down, and they don't adhere. So you you want to kind of find that sweet spot which is 50 to 60%. You guys watch the weather. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is a great website, dafscale.com for seal coating and striping that watches uh, humidity and temperatures as you go into the installation. And lastly, uh, data logging. Data logging is the future. Uh, data logging is as the truck drives down the road, the truck is being measured. And you can see in that screen, it has um, you know some of the, this is what a contractor would see. It gives you the ability to see how much liquid is going down, how much optics are going down, and it's geo-referencing it as they drive down the road. So if they get to a part of the road and they have a blowout or they had to change and they, the, the glass stopped or the liquid stopped, you'll be able to see that on the readout. And so the state is getting to the point where they're really starting to specify this and, and call for this on the polyurea projects for interstate. I know the paint crew uses, um, uses uses them on their trucks. I don't know kind of where the data goes, but this is something that I would challenge you guys to, to call for in your contracts because it's going to give you the ability to say, we want a better line consistently through um, all of our towns for paint, for any of the durables that you're going to call for. So um, two studies that indicate uh, that, that polyurea and wet reflectivity are, are positive, um, one in Vermont on 89 that talks about uh, noticeable improvement of reflectivity for polyurea um, in, uh, in, in Vermont. And then New Hampshire Turnpike, right on the Spalding, right? We have, uh, we've done some tape and polyurea. Uh, we also tested urethane, we tested thermoplastic and epoxy. And from a performance standpoint, the tapes that you see here in the middle uh, perform the highest from a dry and wet reflectivity standpoint and then the polyureas and thermoplastics kind of came in second from a liquid standpoint. So having said that, um, to wrap things up, and um, Paul, if you have any comments here, you know, feel free. Um, inspect your markings, call for that pre-com meeting um, and prior to all your work being done, develop your specification and consider all weather optics. Uh, utilize New Hampshire DOT specifications like many of you said you were. Consider durables on downtown sections and joint New Hampshire DOT projects. Um, consider adding grooving language and removal temporary tape to your, um, your bids uh, so that you can get those as an option uh, in your contracts. And then the last two really you know, high level, uh, asset management and data logging. Asset management is, is that 
higher level of uh, how, do you know where your markings are? How long are they lasting? Are you paying attention to them? And what are they going to do for you in the long run? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and get, expecting different results. So how can you manage your stuff better? Um, and how can we help you do that? Paul, any final comments? Uh, no, I, I think it's went really well. Um, we will share our, our information at the end if anyone has any questions or wants to set up additional calls for and go through 3M model specs or go through state specs for anything that uh, may be workable uh, down the stretch for your roadways, uh, let us know. But otherwise, um, appreciate hopping on. This was great. Yes, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Marilee. Thank you, Jeff and uh, and. Uh, Tom from Manchester and uh, Portsmouth who gave us some insight from an equipment standpoint and uh, yeah any other questions I'll, I'll turn it back over to Marilee. Excellent Mike and Paul thank you both so very much for all this great information today to those who chimed in, in the chat pod and shared what they're doing locally um, we appreciate that if there are any questions feel free to put them into the chat pod at this point. Um, I know we, we've run a little bit over and thank you everybody um, for, thank you Mike for continuing the, the sharing and the conversation, but I did have a question and it might be too big a, a topic Mike to do in one short wrap up, but curious how the future of automated vehicles is intersecting with what we've talked about today, You're not only on the bigger highways, but the smaller arterials or um, roadways, you know, what, what would be your kind of quick synopsis of what, what you recommend folks take away from this? Yeah, great question. Um, where we're at right now is that the cars that are coming into the market, the new cars have what's equivalent to a camera on the, your cell phone built into their, their, their visors. And they are looking for lines. They're looking for edge lines, skip lines, and those are helping from a lane departure standpoint. So having something is more important than having nothing, right? Uh, the wider the line, the more visible it's gonna be, and uh, that's gonna help. And it's official, my son has finally found a way to photobomb this presentation. <laughs> that's fantastic. We had a dog photobomb us last week, so <laughs> we're getting it all. Uh, and the, we did have a question if the slides might be available. I don't know if this is something we can put into a PDF. We're happy to share that out. We have the recording that we'll share out as well. Um, so we'll follow up with everyone on any of that. Um, and then Mike will be back next week. I don't know if you wanna give us a 20 second kind of sneak preview of what folks can expect next week if they can join us. And I'm gonna meanwhile, put up the information um, on our survey for those who want to get their Road Scholar hours, the post-workshop evaluation is coming up. And we are gonna ask you to make sure you complete this evaluation in order to get your hours. Perfect, yeah, next week, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, sign reflectivity, sign management, which a lot of towns and cities are, are doing um, actively and, and thinking about doing. We'll talk about some of the new METCD recommendations and. Uh, the future of sign making, which is digital printing. Excellent, thank you so much. We're looking forward to that. So we'll make this information available to folks. Um, you should be seeing a QR code on your screen now. If you want to scan that with your um, phone, <laughs> it's gonna take you right to the post-workshop evaluation. Bettina is also going to pop the link into the chat pod. She's already done that. So you could also just click that link or copy and paste that link into a browser. Um, a very quick evaluation, but we just wanna make sure we've captured everybody for Road Scholar Hours. If you're not registered for next week's event, we hope you will. Same for the Kenya Rutland conversation, everything else we talked about at the beginning, there's so much coming up. We won't hold you all up too much longer. Mike and Paul, thank you both so very much for joining us. We will see you next week and stay well, everyone. I'm gonna leave the room open for a couple minutes for any final questions or if anybody needs to access the evaluation. You've got that QR code and you've got the link in the chat pod and let us know how we can help. Stay safe, stay well, and we'll, we'll hopefully see you all back next week. Mary Lee, can you pull up the QR code? I don't see it yet. Oh, my goodness. Let me, I'm not sure what I'm sharing then. Let me try one more time. Do you see it now? Um, I still see my screen. Oh, maybe let me see if I... Now I see it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
think so. I'm going to take one last look here. Bettina's also pretty good at keeping track of it. Um, and if we do have any other questions that come in, we'll definitely direct them your way. We'll get the slides. Um, we had a couple comments. You, Peter mentioned that Hanover is using the Graco Road Blazer. Um, they're attaching it to a truck for their long lines. Um, I think Jason had jumped in on a new hand cart that they have in, in Exeter. Um, so no specific questions, but um, yeah, it was good. It was good having um, having the guys from Portsmouth and Manchester talk. I mean that that I hadn't planned on quite as much, but it was. I think that was really important to get that that one piece of equipment. Those those higher aggressive uh, equipment pieces out to everybody. So it was good that everybody they got to yeah. Talk. Thank you to both of them, Brad. Thank you. Have a great day. So everyone, once you have that. That QR code, you are able to log off, um, take your evaluation, and we will see you all back hopefully next week or, or in the near future. Mike and Paul, thank you again. Stay well, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Marilyn. See you next week. Thanks. Have a good yeah, day. Take care.